Well, we're privileged today to have with us Professor Mimi Tang, a lead allergy researcher for Murdoch Children's Research Institute and an expert in the field of allergy and immune deficiency disorders. She consults to the Victorian Department of Education and Early Childhood Development regarding anaphylaxis management in schools and daycare. Professor Tang, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome. This is such an up, sort of up and coming topic. And when I say that, I know it's been around for a while. But when I talk to mums now, often the conversation will come around to food allergies, food intolerance, and what their dietary requirements are. This seems to really be on the rise. Is that the truth? Yes, I'm the same. I go to parties and lunches and someone always comes up to me and starts talking about food allergy. So it's definitely on the rise. Um, there's a little bit of awareness helping us recognise it more often, but looking at the statistics, there's quite good evidence that numbers of food allergy cases and anaphylaxis due to foods are increasing, particularly in the Western countries. Mm -hmm. Australia, the UK and the US have all been affected by um, these increases. Our studies are showing more than threefold rise in the last wow. 10 to 20 that's years. That's a lot. That's a lot. It's very high, very high. And now, you know, you'd, any of your children in school, um, there would be a child with a mm. food allergy in their class probably. It's in most classes, isn't Whereas it? Whereas when I grew up, Hardly anybody in the school had a food allergy. Nobody really knew about food allergies, right? So why, why are we seeing this? Yeah, that's a really good question. What we know is that they've gone up quickly, as I just explained. So it's gone up way too quickly to be due to our genes. Mm. It's likely to be changes in the environment over the last half a century. And the most important factors we believe at play are microbial exposures and the diet. Sorry, come again. My Cro Microbial <laughs> exposures. <laughs> right. What we mean by that is exposures to bugs in the community, in, in the environment. Mm. And actually, it's the exposures that you have from the time of conception all the way through to, say, your third year of life that establish the type of bugs you carry in your gut. Mm. Oh, we're coming back to gut health. <laughs> gut health. <laughs> and um, we now understand that the type of bugs that you carry in your gut are very important in educating the immune system to be healthy. So if you have an optimal gut microbiota, um, your immune system will be trained very well to not react to things that are not harmful. So, if, for example, there's allergens in the, com in, in the environment all the time, right? There's pollen, there's foods that we eat, and the healthy gut immune system knows not to respond. Mm. It just knows that, no, they're not harmful, I'm going to be tolerant. And what happens in food allergy is that uh, somewhere along the way, the immune system hasn't received the right level of education and it becomes a bit overreactive to things. Now, it's obviously not going to react to everything because even the children with food allergy aren't allergic to all foods. Mm. They're only allergic to a couple and not even all the allergens, right? So there is something that happens at the time of first encounter with the allergen that makes the allergy happen. But it seems if your immune system hasn't had the right training, it's more likely to go down the wrong path. Mm -hmm. So, Professor Tang, are we seeing these um, increase in allergies in developing countries as well, or is it just within the Western That's world? such a great question. Um, it's particularly evident in developing, sorry, in the developed world, but we have seen studies showing rising prevalence in developing countries as mm -hmm. well. Now, here's something very interesting. We've done um, a couple of research studies in Melbourne showing that if you are of Asian heritage and you're born in Asia, and then come here later on, your risk of food allergy is lower than, say, a Caucasian baby born in Australia. However, if you're from Asian heritage and you arrive in Australia, the parents come to Australia and then the baby's born here, mm. their rates of food allergy are even higher wow. than the Caucasian born in Australia. So there's clearly um, a genetic factor that's present, but being born in a developing country seems to be protective and overrides that risk. And what, why is that? What's happening in the mm. developing country? I believe it's microbial exposures. Mm. So when we think of that as normal people, is that like the kids playing in the dirt or eating stuff from the floor, <laughs> less cleaning products, like chemical cleaning products? Sanitizers. Yeah. I actually think it's more than that. I mean, the natural default is to say, oh, well, we're all being a little bit too careful with the kids and not letting them roll around in the dirt. And that's probably true to some degree. But I actually believe that uh, the environment is different now in the bugs that are around. Mm. So in westernised countries over the last half century to a century, we've had increasing sanitation. 
So it, you don't catch cholera here from drinking mm. tap water. You don't get typhoid. And uh, there, there's just basically the burden of bacteria and organisms is much lower in our environment than it is in these developing countries. And I think that it's this overall burden of both good bugs and bad bugs that help the immune system get trained. It's a bit like training. So what can we be doing then to ensure that young kids are not having their immune system overreact to the wrong things? I think what I would recommend is um, having a broad diet that's inclusive of fruits and vegetables in the mum during pregnancy. Mm. That would then help support a healthy gut microbiota for mum at the time of the baby's development and birth. Mm. We know that uh, vaginal delivery uh, provides an optimal gut microbiota because the baby gets seed seeding bacteria from mm. the mum. Um, and then, of course, breastfeeding is associated with a healthier microbiota. Mm. And uh, subsequent to that, the baby being weaned onto a healthy diet as well, full of fruits and vegetables. It's very natural. <laughs> yeah, it, it yeah. really is. And, yeah. you know, I was saying this earlier um, to Rachel yeah. that we can think of the gut microbiota as like a healthy lawn. Mm -hmm. And what you need is the seeds as well as the fertiliser. And so, you know, the, the seeds are the bacteria that the baby might get from her, their mum at the time of birth. And then the uh, fertiliser is the diet that the baby is weaned onto and, uh, you know, the breast milk followed by a healthy diet full of fruits and vegetables. That's going to support a really optimum um, gut microbiota. So you talk about putting the children onto solids. How do you do introduce foods to a, to a toddler with, um, uh, with trying to avoid um, the allergies? Because we've been told, you know, don't introduce peanuts too early and, you know, don't There's give them farrags. as well. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of mixed messages. So how do we go about doing that? So the first thing I need to probably clarify is that that message um, is no longer correct. Right. Mm. So the message about delaying the introduction of allergenic solids to reduce the risk of allergies has now been proven untrue. And we were recommending that until probably 2008. We did update the uh, Australasian Society of Clinical Immunology and Allergy Guidelines for preventing food and other allergy problems. Um, and at that point we said, actually, there's no evidence to show mm. that delaying the introduction of allergenic solids increases, oh sorry, reduces your risk of developing right. allergy problems. Now what happened uh, in 2015, a very important study was published showing for the first time that it's actually better to introduce these allergenic solids earlier. Mm. So one of the things you can do to prevent your child developing food allergy, in answer to your question before, mm. is to introduce solids, including the allergenic solids, from around six months well and before the first year of life. Right. So in that sort of second six months of life is a really great time to try and introduce as many different foods as you possibly can. And mm. another study has shown that, you know, the more diverse a child's diet is in that weaning period, the less likely they are to have food allergy also. Mm. So there are all these factors coming in, you know, if we just have a broad diet. Do in... pets play a role in sort of helping that? I've heard two stories, so, do, you know, how they have a lot of bacteria and that sort of thing. Does that sort of help the process of, of um, I don't know, feeding off an allergy at all? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, you guys have done a bit of research. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, other, the other factor that we uh, identify as protecting against allergy problems overall is having a pet in the home when the baby's born. So that timing's quite important, actually. Mm -hmm. So, and it's mainly dogs that seem to be protective. I don't know if that's because you cuddle them more. <laughs> <laughs> They're much easier to cuddle, aren't they, than a cat? Oh, but, here um, we go. <laughs> I'm a dog We're not going person. down that road. <laughs> yeah, I have to say I'm a dog person. But anyway, um, yeah, having a dog in the home when you're born will reduce the chances of you developing an allergy problem, not just food allergies, but asthma and eczema. The confusion that you mentioned, Rachel, is because if you already have asthma, um, and you're allergic to cats, let's say, which is a common allergen for people mm. with asthma, then having pets is not good for your asthma. Right. And it will trigger your symptoms. Mm. So it depends on the situation, the conditions that a person has, whether you're talking about prevention mm. or, you know, treatment of an allergy problem. Well, I guess that leads to the, ne the next big question. 
Is there a cure? Is, is there anything on the horizon that might sort of people can look forward to and have hope in? Sadly, at this time, there is no cure for food allergies. And uh, this is actually a problem. So we ask families that, oh, I should say patients, when they have a food allergy, just avoid your allergen. Well, guess what? It's not easy to do. Mm. And uh, we do know that allergy reactions are common in America. Uh, they reported that every three minutes a person presents to the emergency department with a food allergy reaction. Oh, wow. So that's common. Yeah. And uh, sadly, because of that, uh, I believe we really do need to be working very hard towards finding a curative treatment that can switch off the allergy. And that's what I've been focusing my research on in the last uh, 10 years. Oh. And uh, we've been working on a, a combination treatment that involves a probiotic together with the allergen given as oral immunotherapy. And this treatment is taken once a day by mouth for 18 months. And what we showed in our first trial was that 82% of children developed tolerance and went home eating peanut wow. after this 18-month treatment. That's fantastic. Yes. Mm. And then we followed them up four years later and found that the majority of them were still eating peanut. So we think that uh, our treatment may well offer an approach to at least... Uh, switching off the allergy mm. for a period of time. I can't say if it's permanent. I can say it's at least four years in the majority. And so we're, we're pushing forwards now. Um, we've got a very large trial running across uh, three cities in Australia. And um, we're going to confirm our findings as well as prove that it's better than giving just the peanut on its own. And then, if possible, we'll try and see if it works in other food allergies. Is this in kids or adults as well? No, at the minute we're just studying children. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously that's the next step. We need to go to other foods, adults, and hopefully one day multiple foods at once. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I suppose a question that we should be asking you is, how do you know if your child's having an anaphylactic attack or an allergy attack? That's a great question. Um, so... There are certain symptoms that you get when you're having an immediate reaction to a food due to allergy. The common ones are hives on your face, swelling of the face, lips, eyes. And I just think it's important for parents to understand that this is very, very frightening mm -hmm. to see this happening in front of your face mm -hmm. within, you know, seconds. Mm -hmm. But they're not life-threatening. So parents often get very anxious to see their child's face swelling up. But that isn't life-threatening to their child. What is life-threatening is when you start getting involvement of the breathing mm -hmm. or the circulation. So if the child looks pale or floppy, if there's noisy breathing, difficulty breathing, change in the voice, that is a serious reaction mm -hmm. and that's what we call anaphylaxis. And just really quickly, because we're nearly out of time, just to, I know you've got an app out there, Allergy App. What is that? I know it's free, but what is it that parents can have a look at? This app is a fantastic tool and it helps parents manage their child's allergies both when their child's with them and also ensures that their child can stay safe when their child has to be left with a friend or grandparents or wherever. And where can but they find that? They can download it from um, Apple Store as well as Google. Excellent. And the most important thing actually following on from your question about how do I know my child's having a serious reaction is that it has a page on it where you get step-by-step -step instructions on how to treat an allergic reaction. Mm. Thank you. So you can just select. I just I think that's fantastic. What you're doing is amazing. We really appreciate you coming in here to sort of share that. It's a big area. And thank you, ladies. Always a pleasure. Don't forget, you can jump onto social media and have your say. We enjoyed having you here today too. We will see you next time. Bye for now.